This is a homily for the 28th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 to 30. Mark tells us that Jesus was setting out on a journey. In the Greek text, he is eis hodon, on the way. So we are still accompanying Jesus and the disciples as they slowly make their way to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. As I've been pointing out over the past few weeks, this journey from the Galilee region in the north of the country to Jerusalem in the south is also an inner journey. Jesus is taking the opportunity to instruct his disciples. As Jesus sets out, a man runs up, kneels before him, and puts this question to him. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Here is a man on a quest. In The Seven Basic Plots, the English writer Christopher Booker explores the art of storytelling. He argues that all stories are shaped around the same basic patterns and are governed by the same hidden universal rules. As the title of his book suggests, there are seven basic plots, one of which is the quest. In one way or another, all stories are about a quest. Booker tells us that No type of story is more instantly recognisable to us than a quest. Far away, we learn, there is some priceless goal worth any effort to achieve, a treasure, a promised land, something of infinite value. From the moment the hero learns of this prize, the need to set out on the long, hazardous journey to reach it becomes the most important thing to him in the world. Whatever perils and diversions lie in wait on the way, the story is shaped by that one overriding imperative, and the story remains unresolved until the objective has been finally, triumphantly secured. So, for example, in Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, Gandalf, the old wizard, tells Frodo, the young hero, that in the distant land of Mordor there is a mighty volcanic mountain. His task is to journey to that far-off place, carrying a priceless ring, and cast it into the cracks of doom. In the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones seeks to recover the long-lost Ark of the Covenant hoping to prevent it from falling into the hands of the Nazis. The quest may be to rescue a damsel in distress, or vanquish a villain, to fight a war, or find a treasure, to win a race, or solve a mystery, to seek freedom, or discover a vaccine, to rescue a hostage, or to find true love to wrestle with the question, what's it all about? Or to stop global warming, to keep fit, or to seek justice. And so the hero sets out on a quest. Let me now turn to Joseph Campbell, whom I've mentioned many times before. Campbell is the author of The Hero with a Thousand Faces. As I pointed out a fortnight ago, the significance of this title is the realisation that the heroic figure in many of the great stories of humanity embarks upon what is essentially the same journey of discovery, whether the story be Homer's Iliad or Odyssey, or the story of King Arthur in Camelot, Robin Hood in Sherwood Forest, Hopalong Cassidy in the American West, Tarzan in the jungles of Africa, Luke Skywalker in a distant galaxy, Indiana Jones, 
Jason and the Argonauts, or even Bilbo Baggins the Hobbit, deep in the lonely mountain. We are essentially hearing the same story. Only the face of the hero and the setting of the story change. And why would we be interested in the hero's journey? We're interested in the hero's journey because the story of the hero is our own story writ large. Campbell outlines a number of key stages in the journey of the hero, beginning with the call to adventure. We then meet the figure whom Campbell calls the guardian of the threshold. And then we have the possibility that the hero refuses the call to adventure. So let's now look at today's gospel against the background of the quest and the hero's journey, beginning with the call to adventure. The man who approaches Jesus is on a quest. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, the man is asking Jesus about the necessary requirements for entering the kingdom of God. It's interesting to note, by the way, that Mark tells us that the man is rich. Matthew tells us that he was young. And Luke says he was a ruler. As often happens, we merge the three synoptic accounts into one and we end up with a rich young ruler. Jesus tells the man, you know the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false witness, you shall not defraud, honour your father and your mother. The man can reply quite truthfully, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. We're then told that Jesus looked steadily at him and loved him. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke omit this detail. Here we have someone who is asking a question because he is sincerely seeking an answer. He is truly on a quest. Unlike the Pharisees in last Sunday's Gospel, who had asked Jesus a question about divorce, but it was an attempt to entrap him. Jesus then tells the man, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come, follow me. So here we have, using Campbell's terminology, the call to adventure. Sometimes, but not always, the call to adventure is a once-only invitation. It is not repeated. Shakespeare puts it this way in Act 4, Scene 3 of Julius Caesar. Brutus is trying to convince Cassius that the time to act is now. They must march at once to Philippi and confront the armies of Antony and Octavius. There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. And how does the man respond? Here we come to the next stage of the hero's journey, what Campbell calls the guardian of the threshold. Think of the guardian as someone like the bouncer at an entertainment venue. He stands at the door controlling who enters and who doesn't. The door is the gateway to the hero's quest, but the hero must first get past the guardian. In mythological stories, the guardian is often portrayed as a fearsome monster. Jason, for example, must kill the dragon before he can seize the golden fleece. This brings us to another of Booker's seven basic plots, overcoming 
the monster. Jason's monster is a dragon. Theseus must slay the Minotaur, and Harry Potter's great nemesis is the dark wizard Voldemort. David's monster was Goliath, the giant Philistine warrior who taunted the Israelites. But invariably, the monster is a metaphor for something far more subtle. Booker explains the role of the monster in these words. One may sum up by saying that physically, morally and psychologically, the monster in storytelling represents everything in human nature which is somehow twisted and less than perfect. Above all, and it is the supreme characteristic of every monster who has ever been portrayed in a story, he or she is egocentric. The monster is heartless, totally unable to feel for others, although this may sometimes be disguised beneath a deceptively charming, kindly or solicitous exterior. Its only real concern is to look after its own interests at the expense of everyone else in the world. That is essentially the role of the guardian of the threshold, to look after its own interests at the expense of everyone else in the world. We see that happening in Tolkien's The Hobbit when the wizard Gandalf tells Bilbo Baggins, I am looking for someone to share in an adventure that I'm arranging, and it's very difficult to find anyone. To which Bilbo Baggins replies, I should think so, in these parts. We are plain, quiet folk and have no use for adventures. Nasty, disturbing things. Make you late for dinner. I can't think what anybody sees in them. Consider God calling Moses to lead what is surely the greatest adventure in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Exodus. God speaks to Moses from the burning bush. So come now, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Moses is hesitant. Who am I to go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God assures Moses, I shall be with you. The guardian of the threshold isn't content with God's assurance, and so Moses comes up with reasons why he isn't the right person to lead this adventure. Please, my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither yesterday nor the day before, nor even since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow and hesitant of speech. But God insists, now go, I shall help you speak and instruct you what to say. More often than not, the guardian voices our fear of what other people think of us. For several years, Bronnie Ware was a palliative care worker living with terminally ill people, acting as personal carer, nurse, friend and confidant. Invariably, she developed close relationships with these people during their last weeks of life, and they often shared thoughts about life as death drew near, and they looked back over their lives. Often, they talked about their regrets, the things they wished they had done differently. The book that grew out of these experiences was The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. Bronnie tells us that of all the regrets and lessons shared with me as I sat beside their beds, the regret of not having lived a life true to themselves was the most common one of all. And so regret number one was this. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself not the life others expected of me. She tells the story of a woman she names Grace. Now that Grace was dying, she didn't care what people thought of her 
and anguished over why she hadn't worked this out sooner. Grace had kept up appearances and lived the way others expected her to. Only now realising the choice to do so had always been her own and was based on fear. Ronnie makes the observation that almost every regret of the dying came down to a lack of courage. And that lack of courage enables the guardian of the threshold to prevail. The guardian symbolises all of those intimidating forces, both from within and without, that attempt to prevent us from embarking upon the adventure, the fear of failure, the loss of safety and security, the fear of leaping into the unknown. And what might the guardian have whispered in this man's ear? Don't be a fool. Why give up the comfortable life you now enjoy to follow this wandering preacher? It will be the end of soft beds, fine wines and sumptuous banquets for you. How will you cope without the retinue of servants who tend to your every need? What happens if it doesn't work out? You won't be able to get back all the wealth that you've given away. You'll never fit in with that odd bunch of disciples that he's called to follow him. So... How does the man respond to the call to adventure? This leads us to the next step on the hero's journey. The hero can push the guardian aside and begin the journey, or the guardian can prevail and block the way. This leads to a refusal of the call. We're told that his face fell at these words, and he went away sad. The cost was too great. To give up his wealth was too high a price to pay. Perhaps his wealth was his security. Perhaps his sense of identity and self-esteem were tied up with his wealth. Maybe he enjoyed the power it gave him, but it is clear that he was unable to face the prospect of life without wealth. Jesus has some hard things to say about those who are wealthy. A lot of ink has been poured out trying to decipher the meaning of the sentence it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. In some Greek manuscripts, the word for camel, kamelos in the Greek, was replaced with kamilos, the Greek word for rope or cable. Some medieval scribes found the image of a camel passing through the eye of a needle improbable. So they corrupted the text with what they believed to be a more plausible alternative, threading a needle with a piece of rope. That's not really possible either, but it's a little more plausible than passing a camel through the eye of a needle. There are other commentators who have suggested that there may have been a very narrow gate in the walled city of Jerusalem, known as the Eye of the Needle. It would not have been impossible for a camel to pass through such a gate, but it would have been an extremely tight fit. However, there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that such a gate ever existed. Most commentators today simply point out that hyperbole, the deliberate exaggeration in Jesus' image, is a typical Semitic literary device. Expressing truths in black and white for the sake of emphasis. In other words, wealth 
can often become an insurmountable barrier between ourselves and God. How difficult it is to detach ourselves from the seductive power of wealth. The call to adventure in today's gospel was clear and decisive. But that is not always the case. For many people, it is a slow and arduous struggle. Take the example of St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis of Assisi, who died in 1226, was known as Il Poverello, the little poor man. The fresco that you can see here was painted in the 13th century by the Florentine painter Cimabue. It is located in the Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi and is one of the earliest depictions that we have of St. Francis. As a young man, Francis was enamoured by the spirit of chivalry and seeking the glories of knighthood, he enlisted in the war between Perugia and Assisi in 12,002. However, Assisi was defeated and Francis was among those taken captive. He languished in a dungeon in Perugia until eventually ransomed by his family about a year later. Throughout 12,004, he endured a long and depressing illness. Towards the end of that year, or early in 12,005, when his health was restored, he set out once more for war, this time to fight in the papal army in Apulia. When they reached Spoleto, over 40 kilometres south of Assisi, Francis underwent some form of mystical experience. The Lord spoke to him in a dream. Who can do more good for you, the servant or the Lord? Francis answered, The Lord. Then why do you seek the servant instead of the Lord? Lord, what do you want me to do? Go back to Assisi and I will tell you. Whatever it was that happened to Francis during that night in Spoleto, and there can be no doubt that it was something very mysterious, it marked the beginning of of a call that was to consume his whole life. Instead of continuing his journey to war, he returned to Assisi. For a while, he returned to his earlier style of living, but not for long. A change had come over him. Francis wished to serve God, but he wasn't sure how he was to go about that. And this is true for many of us. We feel that God is calling us, but what is God calling us to do? Francis would often go to the small chapel of San Damiano, just outside the walls of Assisi. The chapel that you see today is larger than it was when Francis knew it. The outlines of the original chapel are marked in red. Sometime towards the end of 2005, as Francis was praying in this chapel, he heard a voice speak to him from the cross that hung above. The voice said, Francis, repair my church. At first, Francis interpreted this command quite literally. He thought that God was calling him to repair dilapidated church buildings, and he set about doing just that. But in time, it became clear to him that God was not calling him to repair church buildings. God was calling him to repair the church, which is the people of God. Assisi is nestled in the lower reaches of Mount Subasio, and the Assisi you can see today is not all that different from
from Assisi of the 13th century. On the plain below Assisi, there is a large basilica named Our Lady of the Angels, Santa Maria degli Angeli in Italian, and in Spanish, Santa Maria de los Angeles. It is the basilica after which the city of Los Angeles is named. Why is it so important? The large basilica was built to protect a small chapel which you can see here. The chapel is known as the Porziuncola, or Little Portion. St. Francis attended Mass here on February the 24th, 1208. And after the proclamation of the Gospel, he said, This is what I want. This is what I am looking for. This is what I am longing in my inmost heart to do. The reading that so inspired Francis was from chapter 10 of St. Matthew's Gospel where Jesus sends the disciples forth, telling them, Provide yourselves with no gold or silver, not even with a few coppers for your purses, with no haversack for the journey, or spare tunic, or footwear, or a staff, for the labourer deserves his wages. The little chapel of the Porziuncola was the place where the Franciscan order began, and it was dear to Francis' heart. He died alongside the chapel on the evening of October the 3rd, 1226. From the time of his conversion, Francis sought to live a life of poverty, owning nothing, totally dependent on God. Here you can see a plaque marking the exact place where Francis died. As he lay dying, he asked his brothers to remove his religious habit. He wished to lie naked on the bare soil. G.K. Chesterton described the moment of Francis' death in these words. Francis desired even in his death agony, to lie bare upon the bare ground, to prove that he had and that he was nothing. And we can say that the stars which passed above that gaunt and wasted corpse, stark upon the rocky floor, had for once in all their shining cycles round the world of labouring humanity Look down upon a happy man. Let's now return for a final reflection on this Sunday's Gospel. Charles Schultz, the creator of the Peanuts cartoon strip, once said, If you do not say anything in a cartoon, you might as well not draw it at all. Humour which does not say anything is worthless humour. So... I contend that a cartoonist must be given a chance to do his own preaching. This is Schultz's reflection on the story of the rich man. Linus is pulling his sled up a snow-covered hillside, but halfway up the hillside he encounters a tree in the dead centre of the downward path. He could get past it, but there's always the risk that he would run into it. It would be a tight squeeze. He sizes up the tree. He looks to the top of the mountain, thinking what a great ride it will be sledding down from the very top. But The tree is a formidable obstacle. Hitting the tree at full speed would be very nasty. Do you take the risk? Or do you turn around where you are, halfway up the mountain, and settle for second best? And that's what he does. He lacks the courage to attempt 
the perfect ride. Sigh! What could have been? The perfect ride from the top of the mountain is a metaphor for inheriting eternal life. But there's an obstacle, a tree. For the rich man, the obstacle is his wealth. Linus and the rich man walk away, perhaps both wondering what might have been had they had the courage, had they been prepared to take the risk. The rich man retained his wealth and the security it represented. But in place of the joy and freedom he might have known in loving companionship with Jesus, he has the sadness of knowing he is trapped, controlled, prevented from gaining his deepest desire. He remains a captive who balked at the prospect of freedom.